In the mid-70s, Zeppelin, Elton John, the Rolling Stones, and a group called Jethro Tull were hot happening and entertaining on the world stage, and most of them have not lost the music, the magic, or the motion. Ian Anderson is the founder and lead singer of Jethro Tull. He is a flute-playing melody maker, songwriter, and musician in his heart and in his soul. It is my pleasure to welcome Ian Anderson to Studio 4 to tell us more. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you. Yes, the non-archetypal rock star. <laughs> no kidding. Awake at 6.30, here on time. What? Actually, 30 seconds early. And clean and sober. Um, yes, both of those. Both of those. Usually I am, yeah. Mm -hmm. Always? Well, in the, the beginning? In the beginning, I was, um, I was a little put off by the... You know, by the by, the, the era produced all of this kind of drugs and free sex mm -hmm. thing, which was a bit intimidating to me. I, I didn't mix easily with other people, especially when they were party people. I mean, this was in the, the dying mm -hmm. embers of the hippie era. So I took to a life of, um, not of abstinence, but just early bed, early wake up, and <laughs> I would finish a concert, you know, as you mentioned with mm -hmm. when we were opening for Led Zeppelin. You know, I, I would be back at my hotel probably 9.30 in the evening, because we went on first. And um, you know, at 10 o'clock, I'd be tucked up in my bed with a sandwich and watching late night TV, and I'd be asleep by midnight always. And and it's, it's been like that all the way through my life. Well, I mean. and that's before they had things like veggie dogs, I think. <laughs> like, you know, before the vegan hit and the vegetarian hit, there were a few, but they were quite odd. Uh, Brian Adams, he's a vegetarian, he doesn't party too much. So, mm. well, a little you, bit like you. If you're like a vegetarian, you. you don't. You just crawl under a stone and. <laughs> Wait for morning, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. So this Jethro Tull character, he, uh, 18th century gentleman who invented a seed driller or something yeah, like that? He was, um, he was an agronomist, really. That was mm -hmm. his uh, trade. He was also an amateur musician. He played uh, organ in his local mm -hmm. church, and it was from an old church organ dismantled and lying in a corner that he took the various bits and pieces to put together to invent his first seed drill, an automated drill for putting seed in the ground. And most famously wrote a book uh, called Horse Hoeing Husbandry, which was really a, a sort of primitive economic treatise on, on the, uh, the most efficient ways of farming, using crop rotation and, and trying to find ways of, of mm -hmm. maximizing the use of a small sure. plot of land. So he kind of wrote the book on what has become um, traditional farming. Horse Hoeing Husbandry. Yeah. That's a good name for a band. It's a little Maybe bit of a mouthful, long. isn't it? <laughs> I'm thinking. I, di I, I did actually once write a song called Horse Hoeing Husbandry. I think it's still in an old notebook somewhere. <laughs> <coughs> but the lyrics, it's just something you wouldn't want mm -hmm. to sing. So uh, I, I hear tell, rumor has it, that you had a few names for uh, the band in the beginning. In the beginning, we were like anybody. We were learning our, our trade. And we, um, we had... Well, actually, our agent, rather than we, um, came up with a bunch of names. And, and for, for a period of about six weeks, I think we had a different name virtually every week because we were trying to break into the, um, the club scene mm -hmm. in, in London as a little blues band and, and the famous Marquee Club, which was really the best place you could possibly be to begin your career. Um, didn't like us the first three times we played there under different names. And it was only, uh, I think, fourth time lucky when we happened to be called Jethro Tull, which our agent had come up with as a name. Uh, that was the point where we got a residency at the Marquee Club, so we had to stick mm -hmm. with that name. And it was only a little while later I found out we'd been named after a dead guy who invented a seed <laughs> drill. I thought it was a name he made <laughs> but up. But he played the organ. He did play uh, the organ, yeah. It was an omen. It what was, was the uh, first <laughs> name? Do you remember? <laughs> well, the first name actually was the, the name of the band that we played in, uh, in the north of England together. Uh, which was called The Blades, followed by uh, the name The John Evan Band. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was as The John Evan Band that we came down to the south of England. Then we became, I think, Navy Blue, um, Bag of Blues, the misnomer Ian Henderson's Bag of Blues. <laughs> it's it a you bit of a typo. Put a bit of an H on your name, yeah. did you? And I, an e I, I have been a Henderson on a couple of occasions, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But tell me about the Ian Anderson who went to uh, Blackpool Grammar School. Well, the same guy, except in short trousers, really. It was, <laughs> um, you know, grammar school, 
back in England in those days was fairly traditional. You know, we did mm -hmm. subjects like Latin and Greek mm -hmm. as well as the sciences and, and, and arts. So it was a grammar school that thought it was what we call a public school. You would call a private school. Right. It was, um, it had traditions and, and a way of doing things, but a little bit stuffy and conservative, which was fine. I didn't mind towing the line and doing it their way at all. It was just there were certain elements that were a little a little arrogant and bombastic. I mean, having having 17-year-old prefects allowed to beat small boys mm. with a cane, mm -hmm. you know, it's just not on, you know, even, even in the early 1960s. So I, I actually got fired. I, I got thrown out of school for refusing to submit to a caning. Expelled. Um, not, well expelled, if you like, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't by, uh, it wasn't by uh, one of the sixth formers. It was actually, because I was a sixth former myself <laughs> at the time, it, it was the deputy headmaster who was going to cane me for some infraction. And, uh, and punishment, certainly I deserved on that occasion, but I just refused to accept corporal punishment. So you so had a bit of well. attitude then. Uh, did you have music in you then, or did somebody influence you to take up an instrument or to sing a song? Yeah, Glenn Miller and his orchestra mm. and various wartime big bands that used to be uh, lurking on a, a small collection of 78 RPM records that yes. my father had. The band so of great renown. It was, um, it was wartime big band jazz that mm -hmm. got me to listen to what was syncopation and and that kind of bluesy feel, that jazzy bluesy feel, which was, I didn't really understand what it was about, but I heard echoes of it again in the early Elvis Presley. Right. Um, with a, a couple of his first song. And uh, yes, when I was 16, when I discovered Muddy Waters, Howling Wolf, Sonny Terry, Brownie mm -hmm. McGee, Sonny Boy Williamson, and all those people, that's what really shaped my musical life as a teenager. And Beethoven? Well, Beethoven, the, the classics and church music and Scottish folk music were, were constant little references on the side. Because but you are born in the Scotland. Mm, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, the sacrifices you make in the music business, sometimes big, sometimes small, uh, can you think of any for you? Um, Ian Anderson, if I... Uh, well, the biggest sacrifice is that uh, I decided to give all the car driving duties to my wife. So I don't own or drive a car. Uh, Ever. Early on. Well, she's a good driver, so it just seemed more logical that mm -hmm. um, she should have the, uh, the benefits of a, a nice motor car or two, and, and I sit as a compliant passenger in the front and try not to fall asleep. In the Bentley or, or in the Rolls? Or well, we, did actually, we, did actually have, we did have a Bentley. It was an old mm -hmm. Bentley once in the, mm -hmm. I think when we first got married, but she didn't like to drive it. It was, um, it was one of those vehicles that truck drivers would pull up at the lights and give you dirty looks. And if you were a woman, I mean, you really had a hard of time. Of course. So uh, she, but she, she switched to something a little more feminine, like a, like a Porsche 9, I think it was a, nine, was a 934 Turbo. It was, it was one of those sort of mean machines from the, uh, the early days mm -hmm. of Porsche uh, manufacture. But as you know, the music business uh, uh, can spit some out and, and some can stay like you stay. And the reason is you're professional, obviously. But the other reason is it's not all parties and money and stretch limos and all of that. No, the stretch limos are actually really uncomfortable things. I mean, we, we did, when we first came to America, have stretch limos waiting for us at airports. And, and it became really quite tedious because you drew attention to yourself. So I, I always remember playing uh, in Madison Square Gardens in New York and having, um, having some limos arrive to take us from the hotel to the, uh, to the venue. And so we sent the limos empty, and we picked up a couple of yellow cabs and, and went mm -hmm. round to the, uh, the front entrance of Madison Square right. Gardens and went in that way while the, the crowds of people waiting for autographs or whatever <laughs> chased, the, <laughs> chased the limos <laughs> down the ramp, which of course were empty. It's a ploy. Well, it was a, something that we just got used to mm -hmm. doing, and, and so we're, we're, yesterday we arrived in a cab from the airport. We, I'm, I actually travel on public transport most of the time. Really? I always have done, yeah. In your other passions, I know you uh, have a fondness for wild cats, saving wild cats. Mm. True? Well, they, uh, it's the small wild cats that I'm interested mm -hmm. in, you know, big guys. Lions and tigers and even snow leopards, very pretty though they are, they do tend to bite your head off if you get too close to them. Um, Siegfried, or more importantly, Roy, would testify <laughs> to that, but that's the comeuppance mm -hmm. if you start subjecting uh, wild animals to uh, showbiz torture. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid I'm on the side of the tigers there. Um, Is it a bobcat you're talking about, a small Well, the, the small species, I mean, there are actually uh, about 26 species, some would argue mm -hmm. 27, of small wild cat, and by which we mean things that are, you know, weigh 20 mm -hmm. pounds or less. 
and, and um, many of them are endangered to the point of being under really yes. serious threat. But mm -hmm. um, there are various cats in Asia, various cats in uh, South America. In North America, you just you have a few, the bobcat, and, uh, and then you're on into the, the medium mm -hmm. to big ones like the pumas, which you don't want to get too close to. No, the cougars and the pumas, no, not a chance. Uh, tell me about this flute. Uh, when did you start playing it? When I was 20 years old. Really, because that I, late? I was a guitar player. Um, I did a lot of things for the first time when I was 20 years old. <laughs> um, no, I was, a, I was, um, I think I first started playing a, a, a plastic Elvis Presley ukulele, I think I got when I was nine years old from a, a mail order store, mm -hmm. um, which looked terrific in the picture. But when it actually came, it was this incredibly small, horrible plastic thing that wouldn't stay in tune. It was truly horrible. And it, it almost put me off playing a musical instrument. But I then got a guitar when I was 12, a beat up old Spanish guitar mm. that uh, I didn't really learn to play until I think I was about 14 or 15 when I started to learn a couple of chords and then things started to make sense musically. So I was a not very good electric guitar player when I was 17 or 18. And then I heard Eric Clapton and decided <laughs> that I should find something else to do in my I, life. I get that. Hmm. Yes, I, I don't think I'll ever be Eric Clapton, so maybe I'll be just a famous rock musician playing the flute, but the way you play the flute on stage well, that's when you I, were prancing yeah, about I mean, in those tights. I play the flute, but I still think the, the ethos of electric guitar playing. I mean, mm -hmm. it still riffs, it solos, it's a fairly aggressive tone that I, that I used when mm -hmm. I first started. But I had to really relearn to play the flute when I was um, in my 40s, um, when my daughter started playing flute at school and it was, um, she came home with a, you know, how to play the flute volume one and was practicing some simple mm -hmm. notes and I tried to help her only to discover that the fingering that she was using for certain notes wasn't the same as I did. Right. And I realized that for all those years I'd been doing it incorrectly and so it was a, a bit of a learning curve. I, mm. I was in Mumbai the day after the, uh, the terrorist bombing of the Air India building doing a, a promo visit, sitting in an empty, very empty hotel room next door and, uh, and I remember getting a fax came through from a, a music shop in London that I'd asked to send me the flute fingering chart. So, <laughs> so I spent the next three or four months really trying to learn to play the flute using the correct uh, mm -hmm. fingering instead of what I made up when I taught myself. So it, it took a quite a bit of relearning. To, to, it sure. took me the best part of a year before I was really uh, confident again about playing the flute and e expanding my technique in a way that allowed me to play more than I, I could as a self-taught fumbler. But as you know, as a self-taught fumbler, it takes a lot of skill to be able to just uh, riff on the, do you riff on a flute? Toot on a flute? I you can do, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess you could, but you know what I mean. Like somebody who's never played a flute uh, and picked it up for the first time would not be all that good. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a testimony to the design of, um, of Boehm, who invented the, the flute, you know, back in a couple of hundred years ago, I guess, and it, it's ergonomically quite, mm. quite perfect, you know, the, there's not much you can tamper with. Many people have tried over, particularly in recent years, to, to redesign and redefine the flute mechanism, but it's not really successful. You know, th this guy got it right, mm. N not first times, it took him a long time to evolve that, uh, that first true concert yeah. flute mechanism. But Perhaps it's, better it's, than uh, Jethro Tull, that uh, yeah. so the, you, you, the you, seed planter. Yeah, yeah, you could <laughs> say that it, you know, the notes fall under your mm -hmm. fingers. Unfortunately, there are some complex cross fingerings and mechanism uh -huh. things you need to know. So you, if you're gonna learn to play the flute, at least take a couple of lessons from a flute teacher before <laughs> okay. you strike off on your own. I'm on that. Mm. Ian Anderson, our guest, uh, lead singer, songwriter, Jethro Tull, 40 years, uh, greatest hits, several greatest hits album, of course, Aqualung, he performed last night in Vancouver. Uh, and we'll come back and we'll uh, go into space because he's sort of been there.